Welcome everyone to the International Armenian Literary Alliance's inaugural mentorship programs, Emerging Writers Showcase. That's a mouthful. Today, we will feature readings by our 2021 Yala mentees and the winners of the Young Armenian Poets Awards. Nearly two years ago, when I first met Olivia Katranjian over the phone, we conversed at length about the possibility of having an alliance of Armenian writers. And I mentioned my interest to spearhead a mentorship program. Olivia was very supportive of the idea and we forged ahead. That initial brainstorming session germinated and became this virtual event. When we first generated the calls for submissions in the spring of 2021, I expected to receive only a handful of interest. To our amazement, we received surprising number of submissions from all over the globe. Narrowing down to just 11 mentees was challenging because we had to reject a number of very talented writers. On the other hand, we are quite proud of our inaugural group of mentees. Today, you will get to know these 11 writers and hear their powerful voices as they read their work. Keep these names in mind because in the near future, they will carry the torch of our rich literary tradition to new heights. I don't want to prolong the introductory segments of our showcase, but we couldn't have mentees if we did not have stellar group of mentors. We are humbled by their willingness to commit to mentor our inaugural group. Our mentors are accomplished writers, teachers, and professionals. It was quite noble of them to provide valuable time in the months of July and August and mentor our emerging writers. Every single mentee mentioned at one time or another how grateful they were for their assigned mentor. Dear mentors, you have made all the difference in their creative lives with your guidance. Finally, none of these programs would be possible without the supportive members of YALA. If you, don't, if you would like to become a member, please do so by visiting our website. Also, we do appreciate any amount of donations to our nonprofit organization. Your monetary assistance will make our organization thrive and establish future literary programs. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce our first mentor, Aline Terzian Zeytunian, who will in return present our first mentee. Aline. Hello, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you're at. Um, today, I am honored to introduce Nairi Abrahamian, whom I had the pleasure of working with during this mentorship program. Since you can read all about Nairi's accomplishments and distinguished career on the Yala website, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the, the writing we focused on during our time together. While Nairi's work spans mediums, her Armenian identity and negotiation with belonging are foregrounded in each of her pieces. Her most contemporary piece, a collection of poems, details the aftermath of the war in Artsakh. Using a poetic and journalistic lens, Nairi transports us into the collective consciousness of a people left behind to cope with loss of life, home, and self. She opens a window to their trauma as they literally strap what's left of their lives to the roofs of their cars. The beauty and devastation in her work is bone chilling. I am so fortunate to have had the opportunity to get to know her and I look forward to our collaborations in the future. So I'm proud to present to you Naidi Abrahamia. Thank you so much, Aline. Um, thank you for that wonderful introduction and it was really a pleasure and an honor working with you and um, I really look forward to um, you know collaborating together in the future. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to read today and thank you all for coming. It's really nice to see everyone. <laughs> um, so I'm actually in Stepanagert now. Um, I will be here for the next few days as people um, as we, we mark the anniversary since the beginning um, of the war. Um, and um, so I'm going to be sharing with you today 
two um, of the poems from a series that I've been working on that uh, grapple with different aspects of the aftermath of the war. And I, you can all hear me okay, right? My connection has been a little spotty, but okay, thank you. This is called Aftermath. In this mountainous black garden, kingdom turned oblast, turned unrecognized republic. Every place has at least two names. Whichever lands outside the bracket determines the side of the conflict you're on. Even if you try not to take one, neutrality cannot take root in black soil that has been tilled to death. Punctuation forbids it. But in the aftermath, punctuation falls away, leaving behind bare topography. All that remain are the mountains, muted by smoke and grief and November and the river. Moss creeps over running water in translucent green veins, scab beginning to form over blood still oozing etched into the faces of men who don't know where to point their guns anymore. Aftermath is not what comes after loss. It's the infinity in the middle of losing. Roiling sediment, sliding down black cliffs, refusing to settle. Um, and this is notes from an abandoned trench, which um, the inception of it was in a trench in, in Martoni in the week after the war. I can think of a few things more entrenched, like language, syllables strung together, a lilt, an intonation dug deep into rocks and crags, despite the odds. Like the abundance of persimmons with every harvest, every fall, even left untended, farmers taking shelter in a cellar or school gymnasium or trench, trees are heavy with the ripe, unpicked fruit. Some, bowing under the weight, have let them fall. Lush orange globes now smeared across heaps of shattered glass and art artillery shells. Bruised, glossy, defiant ornaments embedded in mud, dried blood, and military green. Persimmons and words and all the mundane messes of humanity grow and fall and grow again, fruits spilling onto the earth even when they go untasted. Roots dug in deep as the capacity for savagery. But this, this few feet deep, candy wrapper littered shallow scrape on the surface of the landscape, Field tilled a little too recklessly or zealously. Ditch propped up by empty ammunition crates, soil and hope crumbling between the slats. This dugout will get washed away with spring. Thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> that was beautiful. Thank you, Nairi and Aline uh, for starting us off. My name is Armine Iknadosian. Uh, I live in Los Angeles. I'm a poet and teacher with um, one book out uh, titled All That Wasted Fruit by Main Street Rag. And I had the honor of working with poet Sophia Armen. I call her a poet because she is so humble. Um, she's one of the most humble humans I have ever met. Uh, even though she has accomplished so much in her young life, um, she is an activist. She is a writer for, um, she was on staff for the Los Angeles Review of Books. And I had such an amazing time uh, getting to know her better. Uh, she's passionate. She cares a lot about humans and humanity and justice. Um, she was born and raised in Los Angeles and gender justice is a huge part of her passion. Um, she is studying it for her PhD. She serves as co-director of the Armenian American Action Network and the Feminist Front. And her work has been featured in the Los Angeles Times, Armenian Weekly, Mondo Weiss, Los Angeles Review of Books, The Hyphen Magazine, and The Electronic Intifada. She also loves growing vegetables and the color red. 
and I am so, so honored and excited to introduce Sophia Armen. Oh, goodness. Thank you, Armine, who's literally my sister in struggle, and I'm so grateful for you, and I'm thankful for your mentorship. Can you all hear me? It's good? Okay, great. Um, I'm going to read two poems today. Armine, I'm going to kill you for that intro because I am technically not really a poet. I'm more like a um, organizer who keeps pretending to be a poet and an academic so people listen, but we'll try today and I'm very thankful to be here with you all. Um, the first poem I'm going to read, I actually wrote this week and I want to share it because oddly and I think in the worst way, we are dealing with another situation here in Los Angeles, right, of a possible hate crime against the St. Peter's Armenian Church. And I wrote this poem um, and it references St. Peter's actually before that happened. And I think um, as we sit with the possibility of another kind of attack on where we are, I always think about where we are and who shows up for us and who doesn't. So this first one is called David Ohanessian's Tiles and Sheikh Jarrah. And I'm gonna be reading a second one as well following. So thanks for bearing with me and being here with me. And thank you to Yala for all the amazing work and mentorship. Um, here we go. David Ohanessian's Tiles and Sheikh Jarrah. The Jerusalem style is a survivor carrying artistry on his back too with the leather, leather buckles of a knapsack and 40 carpets and 300 stars in the refugee caravan. David Ohanessian style, tiles in Sheikh Jarrah are blue, like us, and blue like the dome ceiling of my church in Los Angeles when the light comes through the stained glass. Here we are then again, so present and yet unnamed. When the hashtag goes viral, we are lost again wandering. Why won't anyone let us sleep? Why does no one wake us up when it's April 24 and the knock is at the door? I wander too through the Met Museum in the Hall of Islamic Art, slink in and out, slip in and out of each room. There we are and not of consciousness, Anatolia, Iran, Mesopotamia, Syria, words, political imagining, stupidity, confusions, violences, directives, America. Somewhere not here. We don't get to be here or there. Maybe organizing delirium is better than our lucid dreams of extinction. If a shark stops swimming, he dies. The marble of the Met is a prison village. Me harvest, you pillage. In the great hall there of Ottoman court exhibition, a girl with a nazar outside of her dirt looks up at old carpets to find something, anything, the future who they said would never be. The thread is red, the tiles are blue, and the walls blank, and the silence is loud. Here we are there, so unnamed and yet so present, and so wanting to. The prayer rugs on the walls are majestic, conquering, arrogant, masculinist violent, rich, something they call empire, we are supposed to want, with our own plaques painted in blood and gold. The prayer rug in my mother's bedroom is small, kept and treasured, red and blue and orange wool and left for wanting and smuggled, and smuggled on the back with dirtied hands and people who didn't get to say their goodbyes. Here we are there in the mosaics and in the wood carvings and in the walls and in the headlines and yet we are not. Nothingness, they say, has a low white hum. I don't believe so. It is loud. Grout between tiles. Again and again and again. What is the opposite of indigenous if not lost? How can you name a thing by its absence? There are ghosts here, fine, but then say it. There are ghosts here, snuffed out by ghouls. Okay. Um, oh, I'm shaking. Here we go. The next one I'm going to read is going to get me in trouble, so just no one tell the FBI, okay? Here we go. Um, this is untitled, but thanks to my mentor, it might be called Murder Poems, or I'm thinking Cashier Dreams. Y'all can give me feedback, yeah, one day, and then we'll figure it out. All right. 1025, I say. Where are you from, she asks. Here, Valley, Los Angeles original, I say. She says, no, where are you really from? I say, Bryn, I am from where the land has veins. And I knock her over the head with my chair I should have at the register. And I shove her on the floor. 
and I scream all my lungs out onto her face as I tower over her, scared, trembling pink one. And after my lungs come up my intestines, then my spleen and my stomach, a big water birth, I expunge on her. It was one too muddy today, I think. She is a mad woman, she thinks. I think, damn, I will have to mop this floor. But I don't say. I wake up instead from my murder illusion. Instead, I end her, her 235 and change. I, brown, angry, tired, lovingly, at cost plus world market, put away the trinkets from India and the blankets from Mali and the keepsake bosses from Turkey, a world market. And the returns Bryn thought didn't match her sofa, brown boxes for white homes on display. Little does she know we are meeting tonight with the native folk and the black folk and the API folk and us, the West Asians, building together on how to bury her kind in history and live free through the struggle and she may live or she may not. Thank you so much, <clears throat> Sophia, for the first poem. There's something um, so powerful about hearing a freshly written poem. And the second one, of course, was, was so beautiful. Thank you also, Armina, for that lush introduction. So I'm gonna keep this brief because I want Datevig Ivazian to shine. She was a true pleasure to work with. I am gonna read a little bit of her bio just to refresh everyone's memory. And just to say that it was the most natural rapport. It did not feel to me like a mentorship. It felt like to me, like a friend and we were just hanging out and talking about her work. But I just want to give you guys a little idea of who she is. She's the director of the Armenian Institute in London and a literary producer and writer associated with Rebel Republic Films. She has curated, edited, and translated the Armenian and English poetry and Rebel Republic Films multi-award winning art house film, Daniel. She is currently adapting Iris Murdoch's The Italian Girl, a dark tale of a dysfunctional family, which has been optioned by Rebel Republic Films. So you have now a better idea of her and what the work that she did was quite incredible. So I'm just going to pass it over to you, my dear. You did such a great job. Hi there, John. Thank you. I'm so nervous, everyone. I'm so sorry. Such a pleasure to be here and meet all of you. Um, Ida was the most wonderful, intuitive mentor I could meet. And this work started as a short story, which with her suggestion became a screenplay, which is not finished. And I'm very lucky that Ida and Arthur promised to read with me, which is, which is great, so I don't have to read much. Just a very quick synopsis of the story, which is which is a love story, very different from previous, very deep and powerful ones. It's a bit half supernatural, half magical realism, half a cheesy rom com -y thing. Uh, to describe it quickly, it's about Elle. She's a 30-something Londoner. She meets a guy called Marek and falls in love immediately, urgently, head over heels, crazily. They meet... Uh, two more times, once accidentally, once half a date, and then she dies um, on London Tube. And she never knows about his feelings, whether he was interested in her or not. But after her death, as she can visit the living, not as a ghost, but in her full earthly body. And she, of course, visits him because she yearns for him. And what happens between them, I won't tell you because I haven't finished yet. And me and I have different ideas how it should finish. So I want to read two short pieces from the screenplay. One is when she's alive and meets him in the bar and once after her death when she visits him for the first time. Hi, Dajan, too. Yes, and I just want to say that there is a narrative role. So I'm the narrator, but I will also be reading the stage directions. It won't be too confusing because I'm just reading, but uh, Datevig and Arthur will be reading the other role. So let's begin. Fired flying missile. Act one, scene five. 
He's already at the bar when she arrives and immediately gallantly buys her a glass of wine. The band comes on and they stand together at the back of the room. She discovers that he talks during the gig as well. He sings along with the man, shouts comments to her over loud music. I'm sorry, he sings along with the band, shouts, shouts comments to her over loud music, air drums and runs back to the bar when she finishes her wine. Arthur? Shall we play guess the sample? Elle nods. The band cover cans vitamin C and the song stays in her head for a long time. They whisper during the set. He knows all the titles of the songs and samples. She wonders if this is a date. She wonders what are the rules of the game she hasn't played for so long after cancer broke her body. She wonders why someone so extraordinary would spend time with her. Exterior outside the pub in Shoreditch, they come out of the bar clearly reluctant to part. I know the best Vietnamese restaurant around here. Do you like Vietnamese food? Chili squid? What sort of food do you like? Are you hungry? Do you want to have a bite? She smiles back to all the questions, pleased and agreeing. Shall I Google very please? <laughs> no, no, no. I know this part of town well, and there was a publisher I used to work for next door from the Vietnamese. It's over there. They walk around, check street names, and talk all the time. He admits defeat after 40 minutes and they Google the location of the restaurant. It's closed. He also gets the whole story of her life out of her and in the end, they agree to go and try the famous soup at that restaurant later that week. They clumsily hug by the River Liverpool station and go to different entrances. Datevig, you want to explain the transition here? Now it's the next part, and she's dead, but she can visit him. And she's been trying and training, you need certain skills, and <clears throat> she suddenly appears in his bedroom. Interior, Marek study, morning. He's drawing in his study, listening to Radio Tech's Idiotech. When she turns up by the door, Monotone, tense, almost screechy keyboards fill the room. She hopes she can stay motionless and watch him and compose herself, but he turns back. Hello, you. Am I hallucinating? I dreamed of you last night. Elle is still standing by the door, struggling to compose herself, so to speak. To speak. You didn't. I did visit you for real. You can do that when you're dead. <laughs> okay. Pause, curious, carefully, somewhat nervous and excited at the same time. Tell me about it. What is it like? Are you in pain? Is it scary? Elle takes a deep breath. He's exactly like she remembers. Beautiful, beautiful, heart stoppingly, knee tremblingly beautiful, full of questions, smiles and curiosity like a lovely child. She wants to make him laugh because she's been craving the sound of his laughter all this time. She doesn't say anything for some time, just standing by the door, looking at him and bathing in his voice. Marek. Yes, that's me. She physically forces herself to strangle the next phrases she wants to say inside her. How are you? A bit scared. It's so lovely to get to see you, but it's so scary too. No, don't be. It's not. I'm just dead, but allowed to visit you once in a while in my old body. Can't you just stay here then? No. You go back after a certain time, whether you want it or no. I can't control it. She's watching him, trying to keep every single detail in her, in her mind. His gray tight t-shirt, how he tilts his head a bit when talking, how neat is his desk, his slightly damp hair, bare feet, how motionless and royally he sits, but his nervous hands betray him. Can you eat or drink or something? How does this work? Oh God, I have no idea. Pour me a glass of wine and you'll have an evidence that this was real when I'm gone. 
Marek gets up, stops in front of her by the door. It's 10 a.m. Too early to drink, but I guess it's special circumstances. I don't know how times work anymore. Fuck the time, it's Hollywood. Pour me a glass of wine, a glass of red wine, please, Marek. Marek leaves the room to get wine, and when he returns, Elle has already vanished. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Thank you so much, Tatavik, for your um, beautiful language and the possibility of an alternate universe. I love that. Uh, and thanks, Ida and Arthur, for your dramatic rendition. Um, it's my great honor to, I'm Nancy Gabian, and I'm a writer and a teacher. I'm located uh, near Boston, Massachusetts. Um, I've published two books, a poetry collection and a memoir. And um, it's been my great honor to work with Nairi Babuchan Buchakchan for the past few months. I feel like I've gained a friend, a very precious friend. Um, I was blown away by Nairi's writing when I first read it. I related to her experiences as a teacher and a caregiver. Um, and as we got to know each other and work together each week um, that we met and talked about her memoir and I read more of her work, I was just astounded by her ability to write, record and make meaning in increasingly difficult circumstances in Beirut. Uh, she brought that city to me in her observations, the details, the dialogue, her family history, and very astute analysis as a nonfiction writer. Um, she didn't just bring Beirut to me in her compassion and in her strength, she also brought me the world. And I'm so grateful and so honored to introduce you to her. Um, here's to you, Nairi, and your balcony. Um, hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? OK, OK. All right, Nancy, thank you so much. <laughs> I'm deeply touched by your words. And I've also truly um, gained a friend, definitely. And I feel that um, this is the best thing that happened to me. The past two years have been really tough. As most of you know, in uh, Lebanon, things have been just, let's say, different. So thanks to Yala and uh, also, um, Big thank you to Nancy, who has been such a supportive uh, mentor, and I've printed out all, all my work with her feedback. So, um, okay, I'm going to share with you one piece that I worked on beginning of this year, but then I revisited um, and I gave it a different name just last night, actually. I called it 3,000 Tons of Shame. I spent most of August 4th correcting modern drama final exams about isolation and hope. Rafi, my husband, comes home at 5.15 p.m. He's full of news of what is going on in the streets, in the shops, and in the struggling businesses. In the kitchen, I set the plates as Rafi cooks up my favorite full dish, mashing the garlic and adding cumin to the mesmerizing fava beans. I want to eat them with onion hookies, I tell him as I peel an onion. You are the only person I know who eats tabbouleh with bread and full with onion. We both smile. Then, without any preambles or forewords, without any apologies, we both look at each, our, each other in horror. We squint as we hear an airplane fly on the top of our building. I'm sure this is a mistake as it's flying very low. There is no time to think. Rafi grabs my hand and almost drags me to the corridor. Living through the Lebanese civil war and also the Israeli invasion of 2006, 
we have both been programmed to run to corridors and safe port shelters when we sense danger, especially danger from wandering airplanes. On August 4th at 6.07 p.m., my husband and I stand in the middle of our long corridor and look at each other in complete disbelief as we feel the earth move under. Our building dances, and I know this is one evil dance. It moves left and then right. This movement reverberates through my body as I hear paintings falling and people screaming, not one person, not two. I hear a city screaming. So is this what an earthquake really feels like? I hug Rafi, everything else is falling apart. I hug him tightly and I'm so scared that he will also leave. So this is how we will die. This is how it will all end. I still feel items in our house flying, paintings, doors, windows, books, vases. I remember screaming, screaming so loudly just to hear myself. Screaming so that Rafi can hear me. Please, Rafi, please, Hokis, I don't want us to die. I really want another chance to reconstruct and continue our narratives. Rafi holds my trembling arms and tries to calm me down. He is the optimist. Rafi, please, we are dying. Toler needs me. My sister Toler was diagnosed with breast cancer beginning of June. And so I keep on telling myself I cannot die because I cannot leave her alone in all of this. How will she cope alone? I don't know how Rafi and I walk from our long corridor to our sitting room. Maybe we don't walk. Maybe we are pushed somehow. Just as I want to open the door to check up on my neighbor, I feel the impact of another, even more magnanimous earthquake that shakes my whole body and deafens my ears even more. The second time round, there's an electricity cut. The second time round, the impact is much stronger, but my body feels numb. My hands tingle with a weird sensation of heat, but I'm still standing. The second time round, I'm sure we will not survive. I close my eyes and I cling onto Rafi in complete darkness. But somehow I feel that Rafi's on the floor, struggling to get himself out of a painting he's stuck in. Up until today, he does not remember falling and I don't remember hitting myself anywhere. Later on during that week, we both discover multicolored bruises all over our bodies. The aftermath. The day after I step out on our balcony, Buildings are naked now without their doors and their windows, unprotected. There's so much glass and all in the wrong places. There's so much dust and black soot from the smoke. August sticks to your skin early morning, leaves you breathless by noontime and almost kills you by 6.30 p.m. If it does not, then you somehow move on and try to deal with the guilt of being a survivor. Of all the wars I have seen, August 4th destroyed the most and just in a few moments. Beirut was destroyed, ravaged, looted, blinded and transformed in just a few moments. There is a Beirut that we knew of before August 4th and one that we know of now. I'm tired of being resilient and then embracing one trauma as it prepares me for the other one. I want a way out of all of these cobwebs of traumas. 13 months after the explosions, no one has claimed responsibility for leaving almost 3,000 tons of ammonium nitrate unattended at the port of Beirut. Accountability is a foreign concept to most Lebanese politicians. As the country drowns in its own stench of corruption, we mourn the ones who were murdered on August 4th students, friends, neighbors, Armenians, Lebanese, Syrians, Filipinos, still missing, unknown, still missing, nurses, pedestrians, employees, firefighters, all for 3,000 tons of nitrate. 3,000 tons of shame. Thank you. Shahid. 
Sorry about that. Thank you, Nairi. That was amazing. I had read that piece not too long ago, and uh, it's an it's an unforgettable piece. Thank you for that amazing, amazing um, reading. Uh, I have the honor to introduce Araxi Kaz on behalf of Mashinka Fruant Hagopian. I was profoundly, and uh, Ms. Hagopian writes, I was profoundly disappointed to learn that I would not be able to be pre present at this reading or to deliver these words in person because I am so excited to sing the effusive praises of Araxi Kaz. Rarely does one encounter a writer of such keen insight or one with such a depth of commitment to their chosen field and subject. Araxi's work is a force in the literary, literary sphere, in the organizing sphere and beyond. Before I was given the opportunity to work with Araxi through the Yala mentorship program, I was already familiar with her editorial work at Azad Archives, a bilingual digital platform devoted to otherwise marginalized topics related to Armenia and the diaspora. Through our meetings, I learned about Araxi's ongoing research on Armenian feminist orga organizing, which formed the basis for her brilliant undergraduate thesis at the University of Chicago. I also had the opportunity to familiarize myself with her writing, which has been published by Hybrid Magazine, Kuirigs, and Armenian Weekly. From her journalistic writing to her speculative Armeno futurist fiction, Araxi's work attunes us to what is yet on the horizon and transforms us our perceptions of what might be possible in the present. It has been a, a pleasure and a privilege to support that work. Ladies and gentlemen, Araxi Kas. Thank you so much, Shahir, for the introduction. And thank you to Mashinka um, Fiyun Tsaikopian in absentia. Um, it's been a pleasure to be in this mentorship program and to hear everyone else read their amazing work. Um, I'm gonna be reading an excerpt from a nonfiction essay I've been working on called Our Home Across the Border. I met Ruzana before the war in 2018 while I was helping my mother on a heat with a project documenting stories of Armenian women engaged in nonviolent resistance against Azerbaijan's attacks. We had spent a day interviewing people all around Stepanakir, the capital city of the de facto Republic of Artsakh. We walked across the city from the old wooden houses with carved balcony details to the concrete Soviet apartment buildings. By the time we got to Ruzana's office, I was tired from the August heat and from the influx of life stories that had come to feel so familiar, but were so unlike my own. We were accompanied by Saro, our translator, guide, and all-purpose friend we met one of the first times we visited Artsakh. Saro's full name, Sarasar Saryan, literally translates to mountain, 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 and is perhaps the best illustration of Artsakh's national motto, making me sarera, we are our mountains. He had the most famous guest house in Artsakh, the longest stories, and seemed to know all 150,000 people in the country. He spoke in a thick Russian Armenian accent and had his own personal dialect of English, which I can never manage to fully capture in writing. He knew Ruzana because she was a fellow refugee from Azerbaijan, and they had both worked together to advocate for the refugees 20 years later. When we first walked into Ruzana's office, she was finishing a meeting with an older man who sat on the other side of her wooden desk. She wore a business-like blue dress and spoke in Russian in a tone that sounded like she was giving him instructions before he left. Saro introduced us and Ruzana asked whether we liked sugar in our coffee. Once we were all seated around the table next to the desk in our with our tiny white cups, Ruzana explained that her client's name was Sasha and that he had come to her about the loss of his refugee paperwork. We started off asking questions about the refugee organization she ran. Between statistics and sips of coffee, she began to unravel the story of how she came to Artsakh. I was 19 years old when my family left Zungait, she told us. They went to Stepanakert and I went to Yerevan. As Rosanna spoke, I looked at her as if to keep some semblance of being included in the conversation. Her words were unintelligible to me, so I found myself trying to read her half smiles, the lilt of her speech, and the deep, slightly sad look of her brown eyes. 
Armenians like to say that you can always recognize Armenian eyes, hi Ajgid, because they carry so much sadness. Then I looked at Sarum, who translated, delivering the story edi edited and annotated for me to better understand. She didn't see the bad things I saw, he said, and his eyes darkened for almost an almost imperceptible moment. Saro was a refugee from the pogroms in Baku and seemed bound to Ruzana through their shared loss. He quickly returned to his authoritative tone, making sure we had our history straight. Until 1988, we can say, it was normal. I have known Saro for three years and I've only seen him look sad once. His stories about Artsakh always focused on the victories in the war for independence and how the country was rebuilding itself. During the war, Sara was forced to flee when Azerbaijan took his home city of Shushi. I keep having this vision of him outside his 19th century wood house reduced to rubble, mourning the 25 years of hard work he put into restoring it, developing the city, and bringing visitors into the little republic he loved so fiercely. I am unable to imagine him crying. Our neighbors told us that the pogroms were an answer to the Karabakh movement. Ruzana continued. Our neighbors were very polite with us, she said. We knew each other well. My father was an electrician. He was very close with the neighbors and they respected him very much. He made a Horovats girl on their balcony for them. And thanks to their good relations, my family and some other Armenians didn't suffer as much. Our building was long and had 17 Armenian families. My neighbor told me that because of our friendship, no one was killed in our building. A group of hooligans came, but our neighbors defended us and sent them to another house. The town became bloody and we realized we couldn't stay. Our neighbors helped us to get out and we left on February 29th. She and Sara went back and forth confirming the dates. My notes are full of scribbled dates and numbers, proof that their experiences were real. It seems strange to me that at first, at first that they were so focused on the statistics until I realized that it was a defense against denial. Since the Ottoman government carried out the Armenian genocide, the success successor Turkish government has denied it. And even in places where, is, where it is not denied, it is not learned, it is erased. I find myself carrying around a small arsenal of facts and figures and bearing my family's trauma to display for friends, strangers, teachers, hairstylists. After the 2020 war, I listened to a number of programs about the potential for peace between Armenia and Azerbaijan. They discussed the history of Artsakh's war for independence in the early 1990s. They talked about the Azeri refugees who fled from Artsakh during the war, but they always left out the Baku and Sungait pogroms. International groups and experts never mentioned them. The refugees from those, these massacres are not recognized as refugees. On paper, it is as if they didn't happen. Thank you. Thank you, Aroxy. Hello, everybody. Um, so humbled and grateful to be in the presence of so much Armenian creative energy. It's awesome. My name is Ali Nohanesyan. I'm a novelist, and I had the great pleasure to mentor one Peter Hajinyan. Peter is a writer working mainly in the world of advertising. His works of fiction draw on influences as disparate as ancient Near Eastern history, website banner advertisements, and old man jokes to shape engaging and lightly absurdist stories. He is a member of the Armenian. <laughs> oh, sorry, that was my dog. <laughs> he is a member of the Armenian Numis Numismatics and Antiquities Society and co-host of Badmuchun, an Armenian podcast. He lives and writes in Minneapolis, Minnesota, with his wife and sons. Peter's current project, tentatively titled "Passage to Ararat," is a novel about the collision between Armenian American identity and the breadth and depth of Armenian history. It's an incredibly ambitious endeavor, and I have no doubt that it will be published in the near future, and I look forward to making that happen 
and being there when it does. Ladies and gentlemen, here is Peter Hodgman. Thank you, Eileen. And thank you, Yala, for this great program and for connecting me with an excellent mentor. It's been uh, great over the last uh, couple months working together. And so what I'm gonna be reading to you is a scene from the novel we've been working on. Uh, this is the scene set in Milwaukee where our hero, Brian, figures out what his quest is going to be. Sitting with his dad, Lyle, and great uncle Armin on the back patio, Brian stretched out his legs and balanced the plate of food on his knees. While he ate, they discussed who wasn't at the funeral and who had the temerity to show up. Listening to them, Brian finally learned how his grandparents died. Heart failure, broken hearts, people said all kinds of things. But everyone agreed that they'd lived a long life and that it was a wonderful funeral. He, Brian felt even worse, he'd missed it. Through the kitchen window, he could see all the way to the painting of Mount Ararat hanging on the living room wall. Snow-capped and proud, it loomed over the room like the real mountain did over Armenia, the place Grandpa Ada and Grandpa Madal never loved but never visited. Under the painting, great Auntie Roxy and Brian's mom Lucy went over the will, hashing out who'd get the things his grandparents loved. Brian wondered what would happen to the painting. He gazed at it his whole life, but that had been when the house was his grandparents' home, not the shell it was now. Lyle, great Auntie Roxy called out, come in here, it's time to talk about the ashes. What do you mean? Brian's mom asked when they all found seats in the living room. They're not gonna be scattered in Armenia, Auntie Roxy said, but that's what they asked for in their will, Lucy said. Aman, 10 years ago when she said she wanted to go to Armenia, I told her to come with me and Armin, but my sister was afraid of flying, so she takes it out on us like this? Brian's mom bit her thumb. But my parents, they loved Armenia. They also loved Lake Michigan. Let's scatter them there. Or where they met, Great Uncle Armin said, at St. Vartan Church. Auntie Roxy snapped at him. Armin, are you having memory problems? They met at a frozen custard stand. Lord knows if I have to be the only one in this family to stay sharp into old age, I'll scatter all your ashes on the side of the road. Oh, don't start that, Uncle Armin said. They met at St. Mart Vartan Picnic, don't you remember? That's enough, Brian's mom cut in. They asked to be laid to rest in Armenia. It's only right that they are. My parents deserve that. Great Auntie Roxy folded her arms. Okay, fine. Are you and Lyle going to take them? Brian's mom looked down at the silk Persian rug. She folded and refolded the tissue in her hand. Auntie Roxy clapped her hands once in triumph. I rest my case. I'd say let's scatter them in the yard, but the neighbors will blab about it to the realtors when we finally sell this place. Roxy, Brian's dad barked. I'll take the ashes. They all turned. Brian leaned in the doorway and brushed a few stray kernels of pilaf off his college sweatshirt. He hadn't changed yet. It was the same sweatshirt he wore to the party that got busted, the same one he spent the night at the police station in, the same one he wore on his endless bus ride home. His mom looked scared. Uncle Armin and his dad looked confused. Auntie Roxy just smirked. You? Ah, that's not gonna happen. You're more useless than your great great uncle Hovsep, and he was the laziest barber in all of Beirut. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. I appreciate it. It was a great reading. I love the story. Uh, we are. We were waiting for Armin Davudian to join us, um, but it seems like he hasn't come join the group yet. Um, sh I would like to uh, make an executive decision here, and let's move to. Uh, I would like to introduce Arthur, uh, and then hopefully. Um, Armin can join us and we can uh, introduce Perla the right way. So let me introduce um, Arthur. Arthur's mentor was Gregory Jonikam, the famous uh, poet. And Gregory Jonikam could not be here. So he sent me what he wanted uh, to say on his behalf about Arthur. It says, I had a wonderful time with Arthur. 
He's fun and lively and a very talented poet. We had wonderful talks about poetry and as always happens, the mentee, the mentee introduced the mentor to some fabulous poets. We had discussions about some of his specific poems, line by line editing, and also discussed the manuscript and is working on as a, a manuscript that he's working on as a whole, the sequencing of poems, what the beginning should look like, the ending, what poems are key, what poems are unnecessary, what poems should be highlighted. And I think we came up with a full length manuscript that might be ready to send out to publishers. I like his language. I am continually surprised by his phrasing, the way he pushes language to unorthodox effects without losing the reader's attention, the way he submerges himself in his own poetic obsessions, which because of his ability to push at the edges while keeping the whole intact and in our field of view become our obsessions. What is also important is that he's become a friend because of our getting together through the mentorship and added boon. Ladies and gentlemen, Arthur Kaizakian. Wow, uh, thank you, Shahed. That, that was very generous of, uh, of Greg. Uh, I'm a big fan of his work. It was really surreal to work with him. And uh, I, I do consider him a friend. We had, we had great conversations. Uh, I'm gonna read um, two poems for you guys today. Uh, one of them is from my manuscript. It's about uh, it's about paintings that get stolen or don't exist. It's it's kind of a strange thing, but uh, I'm obsessed with it. I've been thinking about it ever since it grabbed me. I'm I'm, I'm done. I, I just <laughs> you know okay. So this uh, this actually, but uh, you know I I you know shout out to Hyperallergic uh, uh, Literary Magazine. I I go to that for source material sometimes uh, to inspire me. And I found one about um, uh, Arshil Gorky's uh, painting of another painter named Anna Walinska, who uh, that kind of went missing. And uh, it turns out, uh, I'm just going to read the poem. All right. Anna Walinska. <laughs> All right. The softest form of silence I've ever known is rain, even softer than a burglar's hands with the thirst of an art collector. It was raining the night Anna Walinska sold her portrait to make rent. Nobody wanted to buy the painting by Arshil Gorky, so the price was low. The portrait hung on the wall of her apartment. I don't know the term for this kind of devotion. What is the word for a lover who cannot be seen, who cannot be sold? Money is the worst form of conversion for this sort of silence. So that word remains unsaid, quiet, the shape of something absent, 22 by 16. Now it rains on the city in the wall. And uh, this second poem is uh, something I just wrote. Uh, you know, it's still in its revision phase. Uh, it's right now it's called For the Sake of My Fallen Friends. I keep falling for the same book. It's a tribute, I guess, for the sake of remembering my fallen friends. I see them transfigured in the story I am reading, always on a high rise, perched on a rooftop by antennas and telephone wires, the homies. Somehow I still see their vapor, the color of a glinted window leaning in the way they smoke spitting out sunflower seeds, running from cops in squad cars, dogs and sirens in the distance, the spray painted signatures of our names on the side of a suburban home, the ding dong ditches, the stream of piss flooding the neighbor's flowers, white calla lilies, the way they grow then later decorate a casket. The ironies we put up with the lengths we are willing to go for joy. If you could see inside the building of a person, would you still walk home in the rain with them? My life has been a vertigo of personal encounters with people who avoid the taste of salt. When they turn away, 
You can smell the pages in their leaving, the way a book brushes the air when it shuts. At least that's what it feels like. The warm touch of a hand underneath a black umbrella, the night pressed into the windows of every home, but no one seems to notice. I forget these are just words, that I am not in front of a firing squad held by the skelter of the sun. I forget that a paragraph has a laughter so silent, you will hear it for years to come, echoing through the half open windows of your body. I forget that a paragraph has no ledge on a rooftop festered with pigeons and sunflower seeds. I can jump off tonight. I can fly for the rest of my life. I can be a part of my friends who showed up bloodshot with jokes, leaning in the doorway with liquor swag, head tilted to the side, laws broken in their smiles, and the city hanging off their clothes, leaping from smoke to ghost in the half light. But I guess anything is a form of happiness if you read closely enough, as if enough is something you understand. Thank you. Marker, would you mind going next? Try it again. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Thank you, Shahe. Thank you, uh, program participants. As we say, mentors and mentees, maybe a little too neatly, we put it that way. And thank you for attendees today. Um, I hit the jackpot with my mentee, Ms. Margosian. Lily is a writer, uh, a talented writer and a journalist. Uh, you might, if you have the time, you might check out her 7 September uh, article in the Columbia Journalism Review. The article is entitled, The Story of Nargona Karabakh is Incomplete. Um, she's published elsewhere too. But the project we were working on, the project, her project, has a lot of moving parts. It's just compelling in so many ways. It's family history, in part a little bit of family history, notably uh, Irena, uh, her, her grandmother. It's the history of a place of Chermuk and of Amosar. It's, um, it's a, a description of a community of hope, and devastation and the aftermath of devastation. It's kind of an explanation, description of open pit mining in Armenia and the associated environmental impact of that, notably farming. And associated with that, we were discussing the economics, like the argument for open pit mining, strong arguments for them, economic arguments for open pit mining, talking about jobs and tax, uh, tax revenue, foreign investment, which Armenia needs desperately. Also part of the economic argument is expropriation, expropriation of the people on the land, expropriation of future generations in terms of the economic consequences of this huge mining operation taking place in Amulsar. Um, it's a story of electioneering in this uh, besieged and uh, landlocked and imp impoverished republic, the so-called Velvet Revolution, the hopes that it inspired, the disappointments that perhaps to some extent were 
not entirely unpredictable, but it's a story of war and geopolitics. And um, it's kind of a, it, and, and at the middle of this stuff, or not, maybe not in the middle, but in this whirlwind, in this whirlwind, the middle of it is, is Lilith with her strong voice, sort of the rudder, the rudder of this, uh, of this, of this ship. This, this ship with so many moving parts, I guess, I won't extend that metaphor. Um, I learned so much from Lilith, and I'm very grateful to her for what she's taught me. And um, this is not uh, so. We're working. She's working on a a a, um, in a, a, a long article, long form journalism. Part of this story, part of that story that I just sort of outlined there, incompletely, by the way, that I outlined there. Um, but there's a book. It's a book. You know, this is really a book. Okay, but first things first, we were working on that article. Anyway, so um, with that, really, I, I want to turn it over to Lily. Um, thank you, Marikad. Uh, it's been an honor working with you, and I've also learned so much um, and really appreciated the guidance and navigating all of these very complicated moving parts. Um, the piece that I'm going to, or the excerpt that I'm going to read, um, basically through working with Madkad, we realized that the best way to tell the story is with two sort of narratives, one told in first person and one told in third person. And the first person narrative is kind of my experience of actually going to Jedmuk and meeting the people and sort of doing reporting on the ground. So the piece I'm going to read is from one of the first person sections that comes earlier on uh, in the piece. July 25th, 2020. I follow my grandmother's footsteps to Jedmuk's water gallery. This temple-like structure is built of tan tuva that's warm to the touch. To enter, you pass through a wall of arches held by composite columns. A row of pipes juts from the back wall, each releasing water into a stone jug below. The springs yield mineral water at different temperatures. As part of their therapy, patients might be advised to drink from the 30 degrees spout one day and the 45 degree the next. Outside the gallery, tall pines provide shade and beyond there's a small lake with a round floating cafe. As I walk the gallery, I consider its socialist logic. The mineral water, a public good, is available at all times to anyone. You don't have to pay a fee. Just come with your cup or bottle and fill it up. References to Jedmuk as a healing place date back to the 13th century. It's believed to have been a resort for Armenian nobility, but there are a few remnants of the city's medieval form. Locals claim the water's magic was discovered in these mountains when a hunter wounded a deer with his arrow. The animal fled, the man followed. Trailing the deer, he saw it jump into a pool of Jedmuk water and emerge entirely restored, rising up and running off into the hills. Images of the white deer are everywhere in town, including the labels of branded water bottles. It's the third day of my first visit to Jedmuk. Until now, my notion of this place was what my grandmother, Irina, passed on to me. Fighting leukemia for 17 years, she visited Jermuk every fall. Each day, she would take procedures and walk to the water gallery where she could imbibe and recuperate. I think of her as I fill my thermos with mineral water flowing at a too warm 35 degrees Celsius. This morning, I have time to kill. I wander the forest by the gallery. Oak and hornbeam trees occasionally fall away to reveal rocky slopes. Narrow streams flow on either side of my path. Now and then, I've come across a large face carved into rock. Plaques identify these huge busts as Fedai, Armenian freedom fighters who took up arms in defense during the Ottoman massacres. Only one face is a woman's. Her nose, half my size, is narrow and aquiline, and her eyes are blank almonds. This is Sosemari, 
a warrior who saw the formation of the First Republic as well as its disillusion into the Soviet Union. Despair and violence formed her life, but here she is peaceful, gazing at a pond, fuzzy cottonwood seeds floating in the sun above. Arriving at the town center hours later, I meet Alharom, a Jermuk native and de facto leader of the Amulsad resistance. Alharon works as a PepsiCo distributor, so large Pepsi stickers cover his white car. Since I started reporting on Amulsad, Alharon has been my go-to source for fact-checking and identifying locals. He has a veteran's build, charcoal, scruff, and features, and a friendly smile. He's always cool and collected. Because of his mature appearance, I'm surprised to learn we're exactly the same age, 26 years old. Today, Aharon will give me a tour of the resistance, which comprises three makeshift barracks positioned along the H-42 highway. If you approach Jermuk on this road from the south, Amulsar sits to your right, while Gundavaz and Keshut, where many protesters reside, sit to your left. As Aharon and I pass by wheat pastures and apricot orchards, he points to a wide stretch of fields interrupted by an ancient church. This is where our great grandfathers fought Turks, he tells me. They defended the soil with blood. Now it's our turn. Thank you. Nancy Krikorian, can you go next, if you don't mind? By the way, Lily, thank you. That was a beautiful, beautiful writing. Nancy Krikorian, are you there? I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm here. I'm so sorry. My internet just went out and then it just came back. So I was like listening to Lily and the next minute I was kicked out and I'm back. Sorry about that. That's okay. <laughs> Um, so I'm introducing today Elizabeth Mkhitaryan, who graduated, uh, um, I'm a novelist and an essayist and a poet, and I worked with Elizabeth um, this summer, which was a lot of fun. Um, Elizabeth graduated from UCLA with a BA in English and a minor in Armenian studies in 2018. Her prose and poetry have been published in both English and Armenian in such outlets as the Haifen magazine, the Armenet, and in the anthology Western Armenian in the 21st century. Her writings explore people and languages and displacement and the prayer-like hope that emerges from an inherited stories of trauma and survival. She is interested in the intersection between philosophy and poetry and finds inspiration in the writings of Krikor Beledyan. In her early 20s, Elizabeth worked for nonprofits in South Africa, Germany, China, and Lebanon alongside communities of refugees and asylum seekers. And she's currently living and working in Los Angeles. Thank you so much, Nancy. Um, I just wanna say Nancy's taught me so much in the last, I think we have 30 days together and she changed my writing in so many ways. So I'm so thankful. Um, I'm going to read in English and then in Armenian. It's my first time reading in Armenian, so bear with me. Um, the first one is sounds I give only to my mother. My hands hold ruins my eyes and mouth won't speak of. I cling to the crisp white bedding new and mine and try to remain weightless as I lay upon what resembles a faultless resting place. I roll to my sides. I roll to my side, eyes shut, and return to you, laying next to me on a mattress we found discarded across the street. The fragile bed creaks under our weight. The room darkens, you warm and latching on, like a child wishing a mother could fill her empty stomach. My soft living mother, wondering if these walls collapse and the ceiling caved in, would anyone unearth us from the rubble? They don't tell you when you run from an abuser, leaving behind your home, no one will ask if there's food you need, shelter you seek. It will only matter to you in your barely breathing body to manage. Instead, they repeat over and over that this cycle you're in, only you can break. But the cycle continues, no matter how many times you and I try to tear it from its core. 
I call you and tell you about the home I've made and we hold the silence for stains that these white linens can't undo. I write about the ground we crossed and it's not enough. I take the stones from the middle of our wreck. I stack them here in my palms for when my children ask, what do these stones mean? I'll tell them of a mother and a daughter who demanded an ordinary life. The next piece is from a manuscript of Armenian poetry that I um, wrote during my undergrad. It's untitled. Patuana Pagi, Haida Tramayume, Amen Aravot, Sohurutsum Pitiliner, Patuhan Pagela, Bites Inch Conlis Sumesit Bahanja, Ait Conel Moranum, Zaina Norit Lasvets, Dutz Hat Ketsir, Dimatsina Pager, Norit, Pagi, I Sankam, Terarnestaranit, Nayetsir Dimatsat, Pag, Kailetsir Debi Mus Senyak, or the Morat Anushituna, Pateri Mechesusvel, Oti Shushuki Mechehavakvel, Ich Patuhan Nelepag, Bites Nasidum at Batspahel, Dursi Ota, Arevilus of Vilel, Dumut Kits, Ditu made it Mazeri, Ukamu Pada Yerka, Vormia in Dukeglasum, Hara, Vormia in Zerner, Zaina, Pagela, Piti Batses. Patuhani Mikoma Bernats, Uja Arch Serkitset, Chipavadarum, Yerku Zerko, Zaches Kashelu, Mek, Yerku, Yerek, Chabatsvets, Morit Yeres at Desnumes, Abaku Tolatsumi Mech, Mazere Yerkink and Shoyum, Yerku, Yerek, Chibatsum, Chiazatum, I spot the reeds. Gorumena, do not eat as Kashum, Linum, Zerkeret are not women. Hishumes ir zerkere, kodzerkerin. Hishumes es tava yer parsa gets. Patuhani nesmotenum, chakata tans neles patgerin. Ankatsir, golor she stertsavets, kezanits, ansav. Elneran cheslusum, yedevi canets, yedevi armuka angitats numemadgit. Pateluyem, chakata chesheratsnum, mam. Kahaki Porots Nere Gutsumes Golor Shiov, Debi Arevel Kiev Yet Arevmutk Matnere Chen Urvum, Husis Teharav, Chestipum Asumen Maidit Maidet Vedevit Nayume, Bahpanu Mekes, Vedevitanikits Tevordevits, Gaspatumes Gidhes Kosirta Hassel, Lerneri, Ofkianos Neri Zairum, Ulezut Idhet Netarel, Maid Barnes Hazif Hanshum. Goloshu Jama Nakavor Hetka Lukumes Uvera Darnum Ahmukin. Thank you all. Abris Elizabeth, Shadow Achimvar Hairen Gartati. Thank you, everyone, friends, new friends, old friends, for being here today with us. Um, I want to say that I had an amazing opportunity to work with a very courageous woman who is so humble that she gave me a two line introduction this morning. She says that she's a lifelong learner with a world shaped heart. And that is true. Elise Yusufian is a US born Yerevan based poet, artist, scholar, and therapeutic musician committed to personal and collective healing and liberation. Most times she can be found doing crochet under a tree surrounded by good friends. During the four weeks that we worked together, we, I encouraged Elise to be courageous and write about topics that, are, that have shaped her personally, not the ones that she's expected to write. We also discussed editing techniques and honing her craft, her poems, so that they can be the best. I also encourage her to write in Armenian for the music that it can introduce into her work. And I think that she will not disappoint you today. Abri Selis. Shad Sharagalchun Lola. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you also to Yala and uh, my fellow mentees and everyone gathered here today the young poets who will be who will be reading very soon. Um, 
I'm actually, as I've been listening, I've been working on a little Armenian needle lace. And uh, so yes, <laughs> that continues to uh, today, uh, tonight, for me and some of us, um, I'm going to read three poems, uh, one new one, and two of her older siblings, uh, born in stolen breaths during the 44 day war. Uh, and those two, uh, Lola and I had, uh, had worked on. One. The Buddha says anger's tangled roots spell passion for justice. I say madness descends from borders lost again without permission. Where is the right of return? to a body whose maps others' tongues have drawn, to a haven intact for as long as small hands can keep a closet door locked. They say conflict, I say self-defense. Under fragile swords of denial and ignorance, the whole world may swallow their version of events but I quit the games whose rules are lies. This body knows the score. Sacred, she is wise. She teaches me to melt sands frozen in time, forging keys of glass for doors only I can find. Two. Gamats, gamats, slowly, slowly. Bathe each fresh cut in our rivers of tears. Remember, take care of the root. Kiss all the pain into shields of stars and remember Take care of the root. Plant battered hearts at Mayashayastan's feet. Breathe truth beyond snag of gray wolves' gold teeth. Be vessel, be witness, be living stone. Sing us gutted, uprooted, but not alone. We are, we are, we are still here. Unbearably <laughs> hungering for a taste of justice, making bread out of bitter fruit. And three. In the quiet between bombings, there is a sound, a hum. My heart still beats. One day, soon, I will return. What is an hour, a night? a year, but a heart keeping time. One day soon, keep singing your song. Come close, my twin. Let me see in your eyes the lamp lighting us onward, the fire no one can put out. Thank you, Elise. Beautiful, beautiful work. Lola, you did a wonderful work working with Elise. Loved every word of it. Uh, <clears throat> it's going to be my honor to introduce Perla. Unfortunately, Armen could not join us. 
so I guess this is a good thing because I got to know Perla maybe two, three years ago when I started noticing her work on the internet and we became friends and it's now she's here. And uh, it's a great honor for me to introduce Perla Kantarjian. She is a Lebanese Armenian writer, journalist, editor, and educator based between Beirut, Yerevan and Norwich. Kantarjian was the former executive editor of Carpe Diem and Nahar newspaper's literary segment. Her own writing pieces have been published in various publications and magazines with her most recent publications in the Armenian Weekly, Rusted Radishes, the International Literary Quarterly, otherwise engaged in Delbel, among many others. Apart from her adventures with creative and journalistic writing, Kantarjan also used to teach English literature and journalism at the International College in Beirut, is a content writer for Bookster and creative communications director for Black Lemon, she is also among the editorial team of Russell Reddishes, an invited Creative Armenia Network member and a member of the International Armenian Literary Alliance. Her poem, But I'm Only Fiercely Dreaming, published in the 17th issue of Penoply, was recently selected as editor's choice. Her surrealist poem, Half Woman, Half Starlight, was selected by the founder of the Lunar Con Codex, artist on the Moon Project as one of the works by female literary artists to be placed in a time capsule, launched to the moon and archived on its surface. She is the only Lebanese and the only Armenian artist aboard the time capsule. She is currently pursuing her MA in creative writing from the University of East Anglia as the 2022 um, Sorry, 22 Sony Matha Scholar. Uh, without further ado, Perla. Hi everyone. Um, I'm sort of I'm sort of sad that uh, Armin wasn't here because I really wanted to extend my thanks to him. And even though you know we identify as writers, sometimes um, words uh, words fail to capture uh, gratitude. Um, so yeah, <laughs> what I'm going to read today uh, are actually two poems, uh, part of my manuscript, which is searching for a publication house. <laughs> um, and they both deal with different sorts of wounds. Um, the first one is the ancestral wound that most of us, all of us here, I think, uh, uh, suffer from. Uh, second one is a, some, is a wound that is a bit more um, personal to my experience on earth. Uh, it's a bit of a sensitive topic for me. So uh, you might notice that my voice is shivering while I'm reading. So don't mind that, just focus on the words. I'd also actually like to share my screen um, so you, you guys can follow with, with me throughout the sentences. So uh, poem number one is, an altar for my mother tongues. This is written uh, as a reflection of my experience dealing with life as a third culture kid, you know, an Armenian born in Lebanon who's studying and uh, trying to master the English language. And so here we go. I wake and my tongue teeth feel like salt mines like cheek bones percolated into my mouth from all the rough grinding, rough abrasive mouth, tongue filing itself, filling itself, eating itself up, down. I go to brush my teeth and mother tells me I was sleep talking in a strangeness in my sleep, a strange, strange language. And now there's blood, blood on my toothbrush, on my gums, blood, blood as though I have stepped out of a fight and not a bed. I go to live thinking perhaps my tongue can no longer carry the weight of the four languages I juggle with every day, every hour. Perhaps it is getting to my head. Oh, look, I think I've had enough practice. 24 years is a long time to communicate with so much people through so much language. But perhaps this is a sign that my tongue is overworked in a struggle to rest 
there is still so much to be said. This has become the dialect, our dialect. The words exit me as though it is not them that weigh me down and slice me open as though it is not them that have taken over the place, the oral altar of my mother tongue. So that's wound number one, if you may. <laughs> um, second one is passenger seat. Many things do not speak to me of reason. Think tapping of a cross onto one's body upon passing by a church as though a condition. It is only essential, my sister explains, the words of her own volition disruptive by the gentle thud of her moving right hand fingers on her solid flesh, forehead, chest, left sh shoulder, right shoulder, in that exact order, the left hand steering the wheel. Inside you, there is a voice and a feeling, she continues. Listen to the feeling. It's gonna be a hot summer, I blurt out. I must change the topic. A drop of sweat climbs down my thigh. It is June and I have worn a dress for the first time. Rays of sun drill intense through my exposed legs through the windshield. There is a recollection. In it, I am a sixth grader and there are many men of God. In it, there is the feeling of my father driving me to the crevice of school on a Tuesday morning. Aram Khachadaryan composing his symphonic way into the tendrils of my childhood canopy. There is myself sitting in the passenger seat of our white 2001 Saab, pulling the flannels of my school skirt as farther beneath the knees as possible, fearing the shaking of the nerve center that is approaching. What do I have for the first period? Oh, how grand we are being taught theology at school. Ours is the first Christian nation in the world, Bob. Christianity is our birthright. I must pay thorough attention. He has no idea. I do not respond. The bell rings heavy at 7.30 a.m. We climb the stairs to class, and the man with the white neck climbs last to make sure no one attempts to skip class. Has us all convinced. There will perhaps come some life to it if you air it out, my friend tells me years later, palming my hand, not knowing she too was there through it all. I envy her for the stories that have not stained her face. She has moved on and found a goodness in their God, or perhaps she was not aware, or perhaps she was flattered, or perhaps I'm exaggerating, but I am not. Their sly names lose me in the attempt of the retelling of the tales I have kept in my custody, eating me from the inside out. I know what they will all say, but those are not God, only his earthly messengers, self-proclaimed. God is great, did I not know? God does not make 11-year-old girls line up in the classroom as though a syzygy door shut full so he can photograph the length of their skirts for the school administration. It is only protocol. God does not leer into your face with aged lust as he chokes Jesus Christ's body into your narrow throat during the Wednesday morning mass dipped in holy wine. God does not give you the only failing grade in class when you write of how you find God, not in the scriptures, but in the rays of sun that pass through your past hope eyes, reminding you of warm substance. God does not caress your unripe neck when he finds you crying in the corner of the playground. That particular messenger was even prepared to give me his own set of eyes if only I would stop crying. He called me sweetheart all throughout. He cupped my face with his large grasp. My friend stares into the ground as I speak. Those are not God. God was not the reason I trembled during my valedictorian speech, all the white necks sitting front row. It was very shameful that I didn't cross myself at the end of the Father's prayer on the stage. Everyone noticed. I am yet reminded when the subject is brought up against my will. It was very shameful. I did not care. I was too excited for college to be bothered by opinions. The ceremony was almost satisfying for my 16-year-old self. Fireworks, balloons, dresses, the high school crush, eyeliners, pictures, cake, the cutting of the latter, mid-sentence, congratulations, class of 2015. In the bus being carried to the prom venue, I was surrounded with youth and dance and song, song and photograph and myself. Amid the ecstatic guys, 
pulling the fabric of my little black dress as further down my knees as possible. Done. Thank you. Thank you, Perla. Those were beautiful. Truly, true, truly appreciative. Uh, now I would like to introduce to you uh, Ellen Semerjan. Over a year ago, I received an email from Olivia saying, stating that Ellen Semerjan is interested in holding an essay contest for high school students. It was a wonderful idea. Most of you know Ellen as the talented artist, a poet, musician. I know him as a good friend. Ellen and I share the same passion to give voice to our youth. Dear friends, I'd like to introduce you to Alan Samerjian. Alan. Thank you, Shahid, my friend. Uh, nice to see everybody. And uh, I'm so glad there is space made for the Young Armenian Poets Awards. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah. Um, I love this idea of the emerging writers showcase. Dare I say that uh, many of us here have emerged and emerged beautifully. I mean, it's just lovely what I'm hearing today. Um, and I'm just really glad that, that our, the youngest amongst us are included as well as a public school teacher for 25 years. Um, you know, I, I often look to my students for guidance, advice, wisdom. I know Shia does as well. I just wrote a few words. Um, and uh, just to sort of introduce this, I, I do want to just let everybody know that um, the HPEM um, cultural uh, journal magazine has published uh, an, an introductory essay that I wrote and also all the work that was selected in this year's Young Armenian Poets Awards. I, I would, uh, you know, recommend uh, taking a look at, at the h-pem.com website if you haven't already and seeing the features, spotlights, um, and, you know, the commentary by the judges as well. Um, you know, for the sake of time, I'm just going to read a sort of brief introduction and then um, ask our winning writers to read their poems. So uh, just quickly here, I'd like to recognize the efforts of all the people who helped make the first Young Armenian Poets Awards in actuality this year. So this includes the writers themselves who braved the journey of making and submitting a piece of literary art for an international contest. The fantastic judges we had, Gregory Janikian, Mashinka, uh, Frun Sakopian, and Rafi Vartanian uh, for their time, intellect, and heart. The entire team at Yala who believed in the idea, uh, my friend Steve Alton who designed the excellent art for the initiative and the and the uh, placards and the flyers. HPEM for collaborating on the publication of the winning pieces and providing that ever so valuable, authentic audience that every writer needs. So thank you to HPEM and all the family members and teachers and supporters. I know there's some parents here maybe uh, watching along who got out the word for our call for work. That is huge getting out the word. Um, it really takes a global village to make this happen, um, and it's evident, it's global. We had a wide range of addresses attached to our submissions, poems from uh, Beirut, Montreal, Yerevan, Racine, Wisconsin, also represented. Um, it was just a real lovely and incredible, um, inspiring lot of work. Just one note before I introduce our winners so we can hear their exceptional work. If you submit it, and your work didn't get selected and you're listening now or will listen later, I know it's recorded. I just want to tell you to keep making and inventing and reinventing through language. And we hope that you'll submit next year and beyond and that you'll enter not only this conversation that we're having now uh, about Armenians, Armenian identity, Armenian literature and poetry, but the many conversations that exist in your world. The fact that we're making meaning out of words you know, those who did get selected and those who did not, and that we value language still is for me one of the most important takeaways from this contest. And indeed, one of the most integral aspects of being Armenian. So with that, I would like to introduce uh, from Holy Martyrs Ferah Ferahian High School 
in Chatsworth, California, 17-year-old Sarkis Anthony Antonia, and his poem is called I Meet the Gravedigger Burying a Soldier from Artsakh. Sako? Sako? Are you there? Hi, yes, I'm here. <laughs> All right. Okay. So I wrote this poem based off um, the Artsakh war that left our community very devastated last year. And the like the imagery and the news and all of the words surrounding the war and in the media about it was very striking for me. And so I wanted to write a piece based off of that. And so this is my poem. I meet the grave digger burying a soldier from Artsakh. Please let me swallow the rain to save this soil. He needs a good home, a dry cavern to sleep. I will not be long, I promise. His exoskeleton, soaked in military pattern, must take one last breath of the world around it. Let me see the red on his chest one more time, poked into the plush like acupuncture, almost deliberate. Do you know who is responsible for this act? If not, I will tell you. It was like this. At home, we were glued to the bottom of a well and stuffed with sand. And I didn't know him until the stones around us crumbled. Do not drop him quick. I beg for you to take my money and give me his gun. Now the flashing medallions on his chest darken, the puckering ribbons washing away without sound. How is this the resolution of an incomplete history? I have removed my voice box and placed it on his heart, salted, immobile. Now let me say to him, you are missed. You, driven to the ground with honor. Perhaps this exile wasn't fated by the stars, but rooted in the obligation of our clan. Above us, the clouds swirl gray and inhale to accept the light. The sun, a bead of hope in their curtains, claiming the parting before it. I do not think this story is over, will never be. I'm hesitant, but here's our farewell. And watch, see how this cavalier has become a snowy dove, rising through the ashes and sunlight away. Thank you. Thank you, Sako. Thank you. We uh, were blown away by the imagery in that work, um, the heart in it as well. And we thank you so much for that. Um, I want to urge everyone again, I said it earlier, to check out the HPEM feature where you'll see the commentary on Sako's work and all the writers. The next writer I would like to introduce, uh, we're going alphabetically here, is Sofia Demirjan Lara with a poem called I See You in the Jacarandas, which I wrote an introduction for uh, in the, uh, on the website I mentioned before. And I, I believe it's a, a real interesting meditative poem that you'll um, enjoy. Um, I believe Sofia wrote this poem in Utah. If I think I'm getting this right at the Heritage School, but is currently at Hillside High School in Glendale and she's 17 years old. Sophia, uh, we're looking forward to hearing you read. Thank you. So I guess that this poem doesn't necessarily relate to Armenian culture, but in a way, I feel like it kind of does because it's a dedication to my grandmother. Um, and she was the one when I found out she was passing away slowly. Um, that's what got me into finding more, like finding out about my heritage more. And so, and not through her personally because she had Alzheimer's, but through kind of the artifacts in her room in the nursery home. And so this is a dedication to the person who introduced me, not introduced me, but made me passionate about my heritage. So yes. I'll, I'll share my screen if I can figure out how to do that. I can't, so I'm just going to read it. Um, I see you in the jacarandas. I look at the jacaranda tree in front of my apartment. I hear your whispers in the wind. I feel your goosebumps and the cracks of your skin. And within them, I walk into the closet of a dream. I can feel you smiling at me through the veins of the leaves. 
I see myself pondering in the nest above your head, feeding my children. I am a bird in another life by your side. I am one with the wind blowing kisses in your direction so that you can feel them on your cheeks, so that you can blush with the rosy pink that used to hide within the dark forests of your makeup drawer. Isn't it lovely how I can see my life now that you stand right before my eyes? And isn't it lovely how I can see myself now that you are gone? Thank you, Sophia. It's a real lovely poem with Thanks. pretty stunning imagery in it as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. And our final uh, winner here is uh, Lucine Kizian, who wrote a poem that really moved the judges um, go light on the sweetness. And Lucina is from uh, Blair High School, I believe, in uh, Pasadena, California, and is 15 years old. Um, and again, you can read the commentary on her work at hpem.com. Uh, Lucina, if you're there, we're looking forward to hearing you read this beautiful poem. Thank you. Um, I wrote this poem about an Armenian living in America and living through different cultures and identities and the unconscious middle that many of ourselves find ourselves in. Replacing the chamomile in my tea with the compact flowers, with purple petals, hugging yellow centers, encompassing millions of beginnings, endings, and middles. I add the floral palette not to remember, but rather to forget me not. Does the honey cause a paucity of flavor? My moral compass spins as I pour in the sweetness. I will not drink tea without honey. I will not consume honey without tea. As my soul lives there and my body here, I live in both worlds. I live to acculturate. Thank you. Beautiful, Lucina. Thank you so much. Thank you to all three winners. Um, just a quick note here as a parting thought, uh, I see in the chat that Sophia wrote, um, you know, that I haven't met as many people passionate about poetry, you know, as I am and in my family. And I just want to say sort of welcome to all, to, you know, to all of you and to this, you know, you are welcome to this world. There are so many people out there who think like you, who, who, who believe in the imagination as you do. And, um, you know, we're just gonna, you know, we're gonna welcome you with open arms. And, um, you know, what you have invented and created is no small task. So thank, thank you so much to all three of you. And thank you to uh, Yalla and HPEM for uh, creating the stage for all this. Thank you. Thank you so much to all our readers uh, for sharing their work today. I'm oh, so moved uh, by your powerful stories and, and I'm just uh, speechless really. I'm so grateful to be in, in the presence of, of so much creative energy and talent. Uh, my writing and my writing journey have been shaped by the mentors in my life. And so beginning our mentorship program with Shahe was to me, one of the most uh, important things we're doing here at, at Yala. It's not easy to be a writer, uh, creatively, professionally, anyway. Um, and so we need guidance and encouragement and friendship. So we're not walking this path alone. Our mentorship was made possible by our incredibly devoted team of mentors. Thank you, thank you, thank you for donating your time to lifting up our next generation of Armenian writers. It was so heartwarming to receive messages all summer from both mentees and mentors uh, expressing how much they were learning from each other and growing. Uh, I'm so glad our mentees also have connected with each other and supported each other. And I hope as you move forward, you see each other as a literary family within our larger family here at Yala. And as Alan said, you are all welcome to join us. Uh, as, as Elise read in her gorgeous poem, seeing us gutted, uprooted, but not alone. Uh, don't be strangers. Poets, 
uh, mentees, audience members. Uh, even though our mentorship program is officially over and our poetry contest is officially over for this year, please know that we hope you'll always come to us with your work, with your questions, um, with anything. So thank you so much to Alan Samerjan for his vision and devotion to encouraging young poets to express themselves in a literary and creative way. Uh, to HPEM for our, you know, being our partner in this, in, in this contest uh, and for publishing uh, the poems that we heard tonight and uh, another poem by, by one of our, uh, on, by our honorable mention. Thank you to our judges, Gregory Janikian, Nishinka, Firun Zagopian, and Rafi Bartanyan for giving so much thought to the many poems we received. Um, it was really a pleasure to see the discussions back and forth. Um, they feel really strongly about uh, poetry and, and talent, and, and um, it was really nice to see the judges come together too. So uh, if you're interested in donating to Yala uh, to allow us to continue programming like this, please visit our website or become a member. Uh, just lastly, I wanna say thank you all. Uh, I know that the stories you've shared will, will fuel me through the coming days. I just feel so energized right now and I hope you continue to fuel each other. Keep writing. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia. I think Cyrus is now gonna unmute everyone so we can clap where we can do a round of oh, applause. Wait, so. wait, wait, wait. I didn't think so. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> no, no. Oh, thank you. No. Thank you, Shahe. Um, <laughs> thank you, guys. Uh, yeah, we can clap for everyone. I think we can get out and muted. Yay. Thank you, everyone. Bravo. Bravo, bravo. Yeah, Keep writing, keep writing. So oh, beautiful. Bravo to everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you, Shahed. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. And thanks Thank to you. Olivia for being a driving force behind all this. Thank you, Shahed and Alan. You're all amazing. Thank you, Yala. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Definitely read the honorable mention too. She was a remarkable writer as well. I know Olivia mentioned it. Thank you so much, everybody. Keep writing. Thank you all.